Well, Barbara Brown Taylor tells the following story. She says, once in a meeting of teachers of religion, someone gave an inspiring talk about how exciting his students had been with the wilderness rafting and camping trips he took them on. There's something about the riskiness of it, he said, that opened them up in new ways that the classroom never could, and that even when they went back to the classroom, they seemed more willing to take risks with each other as well. And when he was done telling his story, another teacher raised his hand and said, excuse me, but were your students ever in real danger? And the first teacher said, oh no, I would not let that happen. And the second teacher said, well, if there wasn't any real danger, then it isn't a real wilderness. Because in a real wilderness, there has to be something that can kill you. She goes on to say this, wilderness is a place where the death of your identity, the death of your certainty, the death of your old community, and your life as you know it, all those deaths are entirely possible. They're all in mortal danger. And though the dangerous thing doesn't have to kill you, it can. Otherwise, you're not in a wilderness. You're in a park, where there are rangers to keep the trails clear and keep dangerous things at a distance so you can take pictures without becoming anyone's food. But since we're working a metaphor here, let's not forget the dangerous place where there are no mountains or bears. If you've ever spent time in a radiology oncology unit, that's a wilderness. So is a neighborhood where parents have to teach their kids what to do when they hear gunfire. A dying church, a wilderness. Addiction, wilderness. Losing too many friends all at once is a wilderness, especially when they're young. Aging is a wilderness. Deep love for a suffering planet is a wilderness. Basically, anything that shows you how breakable you are, how breakable everything is, does the trick, which means, face it, wilderness is not an optional part of the human condition. No one gets a pass. Sooner or later, everyone comes to a place of frighteningly diminished resources where everything that could have been done has been done, and things that could once be ignored can no longer be ignored. Even if you thought you had accepted the fact that none of us can control our lives, that we only have the illusion of control, still the full loss of that illusion can take your breath away. So this is how bad things really can get. So this is who you really are, with all your props kicked out. Isn't it interesting then that Jesus, before he did just about anything else in his life, before he started his ministry, before he preached a sermon, before he healed anybody, that Jesus was led out into a wilderness, to that place where something can kill you. It isn't mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, but when Mark tells this story, he says Jesus was with the wild animals. The place where you realize how breakable you are and how breakable everything is, Jesus went there. This place is an inevitable part of the human condition, and our Savior and our guide and our Lord went there. Taylor goes on to say that this about our wilderness experiences in our lives. She says, if you're a believer, there's one more thing that you have to clarify, which is God's presence in this all. Is this a trial? Is it a punishment, a correction, an oversight? Is this refiner's fire? Or is this the definitive absence that you feared all along? In the wilderness, she says, the answer to these questions is the one thing left to you to decide what it all really means. So where is God in the wilderness? I think Jesus' experience in the wilderness has something to say about that question. Now this is your periodic reminder that Bibles do not, did not come to us at first with chapters and verses marked out. And I needed to remind you of this this morning because this is still a story that is part of Jesus' opening act. He hasn't yet begun his ministry. This is how Jesus is being equipped for ministry. What Jesus experiences in the wilderness is, you might say, in today's uh, parlance, part of his seminary training for what he's going to do for the rest of his life. 
And what Jesus experienced in the wilderness was immediately preceded by his baptism, which is why I backed up a little bit and read the end of chapter 3. The last thing we read before Jesus was led out into the wilderness was, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led into the spirit, or by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So we might think that perhaps the baptism of Jesus was the moment which was infused with the presence and the love of God, and the wilderness is a place where God was absent. After all, the wilderness is a place where something might kill you. Where is God in those kind of places? And yet this scripture story is very clear that it was not very long after Jesus came up out of the water and before he began to preach and teach and heal or perform any kind of miracle at all, that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness place. So the wilderness is not a punishment, and it's not a mistake, and it's not a miscalculation. It was intentional. Not only that, God was equally present here in the desert, just as he was when Jesus was baptized. I think it gets at this just a little bit in the second temptation, as Matthew tells the story. In that part of the story, the devil takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple and says, since you are the son of God, jump. And the devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91, he has placed you in the care of the angels. They will catch you so that you won't so much stub your toe on a stone. And Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy, don't you dare test the Lord your God. Interestingly, when Jesus was countering with the quotation from Deuteronomy, don't test the Lord your God, this is a part of the Bible that is referencing a story in Exodus where the people of Israel were wandering in the desert, or the wilderness, and they're thirsty. And they argued with Moses, as they often did. And they claimed that they had been brought out of Egypt into that desert just so they could die of thirst. And so God instructs Moses to strike a rock to produce water, and that's what Moses did. He provided water to the people from a rock. And this story ends this way. He, Moses, called that place Massa, test, and Meribah, quarrel, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? The people of Israel asked when they were wandering in the wilderness. Because they reasoned, if God were really with us, we would not be thirsty. And the answer to their question, in their case, uh, was a rock a rock gushing with water, exactly what they needed, and that told them that, yes, of course the Lord was with them. Now, we might ask this question, but we might ask it a little bit differently. We might ask it this way. If God is really with me, then why did I get cancer? Or perhaps if God really cared about me, then why didn't I get that job? Or maybe if God was really listening to my prayers, then why did my parents get a divorce? We might even ask it as a congregation. If God is really with us, then why are there fewer people here than there used to be? This is a question that comes up whenever people we know or even ourselves are in pain or we're suffering. The question is one that we go to whenever we encounter the wilderness, whatever that wilderness might be. And it makes total sense. When you're struggling, when you're suffering, when you're in pain, That's enough very often to make us question if God really loves us, to wonder if maybe God has forgotten all about us. Some people might even begin to think that none of this faith stuff was real to begin with. I think it's very natural to ask the question, is the Lord among us or not? And Jesus is being tested here or tempted. The word means the same thing in the Greek. And it's getting at that very question Now, one commentary that I read this week said that to be tempted by something, it actually has to be something you kind of want. For instance, I'm not very tempted to go out and eat a whole pile of mushrooms. I don't like mushrooms. But if you put ice cream in front of me or ketchup chips or chocolate, well, I might want to take and eat. 
So we might ask ourselves, what about this offer tempts Jesus? The devil is doing the tempting, so he has to say something here that Jesus actually wanted to have or might want to have. Why does he say, since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here? You won't get hurt. In fact, you'll be just fine. You won't even stub your toe on a stone. After all, God is there. Isn't God always there? Don't you want to prove it? And I kind of understand. I want to know this. I want to know with certain that God is always with us. I'd even love the guarantee from Psalm 91 if someone could give it to me that if God is with me, then nothing bad could happen to me. Wouldn't that be a great way for Jesus to know with certainty, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he really is the Son of God? if he were to do something dangerous and God protected him. Or, if he does know it for certain, perhaps he does, then this would prove it to everyone else. That God really was with Jesus, each and every moment, through every situation, protecting him all the while. If Jesus could just fly off into the arms of certain death and know that he would be caught and protected, wouldn't that prove once and for all that God is with Jesus? And Jesus' response to this temptation is to quote back an ancient memory of the people of Israel when they tested God, when they questioned whether God was even really real since they were in the desert and they were worried they were going to die of thirst. And they discovered that God was there. Even though they were scared, even though they were worried about their future, even though they thought we are as good as gone, God was still there with them. And at the end of Jesus' time in the wilderness, after he'd been tempted these three times, the devil left him, we read, and the angels attended him. So the story actually begins with the love of God that was expressed at Jesus' baptism, and it ends with angels, messengers of God, attending Jesus, ministering to his needs. So the love of God brackets this entire story. The love of God is the one thing that does not go away, even in the wilderness. One writer says this, the way Matthew tells a story suggests that despite the temptation and the struggle of the faithful and fasting and thus famished Jesus, this battle does not happen in a place where God is absent. We as pilgrims of the cross know that no such godless place exists. God is. God is. And therefore, there is no place and no human struggle and no test and no pain and no worry and no suffering where God is not. And that's why it's important that we keep remembering that not so very long ago in Matthew's memory, Jesus was given the name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God was with the people of Israel when they thirsted in the desert. God was with Jesus when he was being tempted or tested in the wilderness. Because even though the wilderness is not a comfortable place, even though the wilderness is a place where something might actually try to kill you, even so, you are not beyond God's reach in the wilderness. Jesus is not alone, and neither are we alone when we spend time there. I have one more observation that kind of connects Jesus' baptism with his wilderness experience. This one is from Lucy Pepiot. She writes this, One of the things I find interesting is that the angels are an added extra to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has already received the Spirit at his baptism. He had the Holy Comforter with him so that he could be strengthened for the ordeal of the desert. And yet God the Father didn't leave him with only that. Through the gift of the angel's presence, Jesus was given something more tangible She writes, I always think of Jesus as the strong one. He is the one who strengthens, comforts, and draws alongside the sheep to save and to rescue and to heal. Jesus is the rock, the one that we can lean on. And yet in the wilderness, God sent angels to care for him. Now, we don't know a lot about angels from the scriptures. We know they can appear to us very much like human beings, or they can seem more divine. We know that they are intermediaries between us and God, and that God normally sends them to humanity as messengers. In fact, angel is sometimes translated messenger. In this instance, however, 
the angels have a caring and protective role. We know that angels can care and protect, as the devil reminded Jesus in Matthew 4, verse 5, taunting him with a quote from Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Psalm 91 is a song that expresses, perhaps more than any other psalm, the promise of God's protection. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him in Psalm 91. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That's verses 14 through 16. So surely this should be true for the beloved Son of God. And yet when it comes to the point of mortal danger on the cross, Psalm 91 doesn't work in the way it seems to promise. Of course, Jesus could have called on the Father to send angels again to save him from death, but he didn't. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit agreed that Jesus would go to death and triumph over it for the sake of the world. And the angels actually come afterward. The women find them when they're waiting at the empty tomb. What does this tell us about God and us? We know that we, like Jesus, are not spared the ordeals and hardships of life. We often find ourselves in a desert. But in Matthew, we see God's willingness to care and to protect even when we are exposed to hardships. Jesus spoke about himself as one who serves, but in the desert we see God himself in the Son receiving ministry. We see the practice of ministering and serving woven into the fabric of the universe where God the Father and God the Son sent angels to serve, or God the Spirit sent angels to serve God the Son. This means we don't always have to be stoic and brave. We can receive care when we need it. And sometimes we think that being brave is a virtue. If we don't crumble under pressure, then we're strong. In Christian terms, we might think this demonstrates how firm we are in our faith, but God cares for us in our vulnerability and need and promises that in our weakness, he is our strength. We don't have to prove that we are not weak. We just have to be weak, and God will help. Even Jesus admitted his need for care. Once, I think it was when I was preparing a Christmas or Christmas Eve message, I came across a quote from an old TV show called Evening Shade. And in this show, there were two elementary school-age children, and they were getting ready for bed. And they were looking out their bedroom windows over the porch, and they were chatting. And the little boy said, do you ever feel lonely and scared? And his sister replied, well, sometimes. But then I remember what they say in Sunday school about how God is always with us, and I feel better. And the boy thought for a few minutes, and then he said, yeah, well, that praying stuff is all right, I guess, but sometimes you just need somebody with some skin on them. Perhaps that's what Jesus needed in this moment, not the gift of the Holy Spirit. He already had the Holy Spirit. He already knew that from his baptism. In this case, at this time, God ensured that Jesus would have somebody with some skin on them to come and serve him just when he needed it, just when he was not prepared to be the rock for anybody else, when he needed to draw strength from outside himself. Now, of course, this passage is a rich passage, and there's a lot to say about how Scripture is used or misused when we quote it, about temptations, both Jesus and our own temptations, about whose voices we listen to and why. But perhaps for this morning, it is enough to say this, Jesus' experience in the wilderness reminds us that God is still with us, even when we face our own wildernesses. And one way we know that is by looking for somebody with some skin on them, someone who comes and serves us in our time of need. Or maybe we could be somebody with skin on for others. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? God of strength, your son Jesus withstood many temptations, because he knew you, and he knew that your love for him was greater than any earthly desires. May we love you, and may we also know your love and your presence with us, that we may withstand anything that threatens to stand between us and your love. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Wherever the Spirit sends you this week, carry your belovedness with you. Following Christ, draw upon the word for your strength. Choose to worship and serve God, only God, whose blessing fills you and flows through you. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Spirit be with you and remain with you until we meet again. Amen.